Coming up, the New York football giants continue their journey through OTAs. We get a sample size of Daniel Jones in seven on seven. Malik neighbors out there on the field, of course, but position battles looking into the running back room. Tyrone Tracy seems to be involved. Who's going to make this roster? How effective are they going to be? And is it all just fodder behind Devin Singletary? We get into the conversation coming up next. Uh, yes, my friends, it is OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where you know that we are your hosts over here, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andrew Makowitz. We're healthy, we're wealthy, we're wise, we're talking, not training camp, but OTAs, not, not, not training camp, Andy, but OTAs, a little taste, getting a sense of where this team is, hopefully getting a look at the offensive line, some projections there we want to get into, talk about some position battles we're going to highlight here, maybe even plant our flag in the running back room, but first and foremost, Daniel Jones, seven on seven. This is a, a a metric test to say that, yes, he should progress nicely. He should be ready for training camp in full go. He should be ready to go week one of the NFL season. This has been the expectation, but it looks like all those boxes to check have been happening here along the way. Yeah, and, and this is not a will Drew Locke beat out Daniel Jones discussion. This is just health-wise whether or not Daniel Jones could be available for week one, which is the way that we're approaching this is that I personally, and I think you think the same thing, if he is healthy, he will be the starter week one. But yes. like this was the first step in seven on seven to be able to say, are you healthy enough? Are you progressing the right way? Has your offseason work been okay? If he was sitting off to the side, still rehabbing, no con no contact or no, no team activities at all, you maybe would say, huh, I don't know how much time there is between now and the regular season for him to get ready. But this is the first step in the process. It, and, it, and it seems like, you know, for health wise, everything is going well. And I listen, and I hope that it does continue to go well. You and I talked about this a little bit on the podcast and also off the podcast a lot where I, I've been, I've been battling behind the scenes here about like talking Daniel Jones, because everything is always about, well, they should have already traded him. He shouldn't be on this team. He's not going to be able to win for them. And I get all of that. And I try to reset myself just like I do with every single draft class every year. Hey, They've been, they've been drafted. It doesn't matter if I thought whether they were the best prospect or I would have taken them there. They're now a giant. Let's see if they can be productive. Let's see what we can expect from them. That's what I'm going to do with Daniel Jones. The expectation is, hey, I want to see him be healthy. Why? Because he's one of the most, he's the viable quarterback on, on, on the roster right now. So I hope that he's healthy. I hope that he starts to look good. I hope he forms connections with Malik neighbors. And I hope that we're just talking about how does he look in practice? How does he look getting towards the regular season? Because that's all there is to do here. There, there, there is no Aaron Rodgers. There's no Joe Burrow. There's no Patrick Mahomes getting brought in the door here. So I, I sound angry about it, but ultimately I feel good just about resetting myself on he's the Giants quarterback. Let's just see what happens. It, it, this is where we are now as a team. So, okay, I have a question for you, and this sure. may totally derail our show, but it's sure. it's about Daniel Jones, but more just in the philosophical sense about being a fan mm. of a team. Mm. So, like, it feels like people are saying there, there's a faction of people that say that Daniel Jones' play is not good enough. We need another alternative. We'd like to go in a different direction. That's, That's totally right. fine. There also feels like another faction of, of fans that is actively – rooting for Daniel <laughs> yeah, Jones to fail is. so that they can be proven right about their discussion point. And my question is, do you think that that's true? Do you think that there's a group of people that are like, I want this team to be terrible. So Daniel Jones, like, be because I want Daniel Jones to fail so that I like, for whatever reason, we can move sure. on faster from Daniel Jones or, or like I can prove to everyone that I knew what I was talking about the whole time. I, I think that well, there hasn't been a new sample size yet. So the last taste is Daniel Jones last season before the injury, not looking good, right? So you take that and you extrapolate it out. You call the playoff year a fluke and you say, Daniel Jones is not the guy. If you didn't believe Daniel Jones was the guy when he was drafted, the question I would put back to the, that, that segment of the fan base is, were you allowing yourself to be swayed? Were you allowing yourself to be impressed by you know, what he did in that playoff run, beating the Minnesota Vikings? It doesn't mean you have to think there and say, oh, he's going to now be a top five quarterback in the league, a top 10 quarterback in the league. But there's intellectual dishonesty. If you say this is what it is and then don't allow information to inform it, as it stands right now, neither you or I think that Daniel Jones is going to end up being one of the elite quarterbacks or a franchise quarterback or necessarily with the Giants for the last two years of his contract after this upcoming season. But if he comes out and plays well to start the year, 
I'm going to say that was a good week one. Let's see if he can do it in week two. Hey, the connection with Malik Neighbors looks like the number one wide receiver mattered here. So I think it's fine to not like Daniel Jones or want to move on from him. I think it'll be interesting to see how the fan base responds because actively, to your point, rooting against a player that's on your team because you want to be right about it. Well, that seems insane. Like my goal here is to be proven wrong. I want Daniel Jones to play so well that it's another difficult conversation for the Giants as the year winds down. Hey, Jones played really well. Maybe we are going to move on from him. Maybe he'll have some type of value on the trade market and the Giants still want to go younger and get a rookie QB in the door. Maybe that's the case, but I, I, I would hate to think that you're more concerned about your own idea or your own agenda with the team than you are about the team being successful. And Daniel Jones is going to be a part of their success this year, whether you like it or not. Yeah, I think I think or it's failure. important. The, the last <laughs> note that you you had made on that was was basically to say, like, hey, we want him to succeed because don't you want every asset on the Giants to be as valuable as possible? Like whether or not he's going to be here long term or not. Like if he played really, really well and there was a team out there like, hey, we could use Daniel Jones. So that guaranteed money is only for you know, half for another year. What yep. if you're the Raiders and you've decided like, Hey, we're decent enough where we just need a little bit of an upgrade over Aiden O'Connell. Like there are worlds where like Daniel Jones plays well, the giants look good. They're just the next quarterback away, but Daniel mm -hmm. Jones still has value on the open market. The one thing that I want to make clear is this isn't a, a Greg Hardy situation where people are actively mm -hmm. rooting against Daniel Jones because of like off field things or like whatever he may have done in his personal life. Yeah. This is literally just people not liking the quarterback because either he doesn't process information fast enough, gets injured, but whatever the case may be, it just, it feels like it's strange how there's all, like people that are just, no matter what I root for all giants. Cause I want the team to be successful and that gives me happiness, but there's different levels to fandom, I guess. And there's also a part of this too. And I agree with you. It's like, it should be an easy guy to root for. It's not like Daniel Jones has done anything wrong. I mean, you know, he's, he's been injured and he hasn't been a great quarterback, uh, you know, hold, hold it against him. Sure. Because you want him to be a good, a good player. I think sometimes the, the reaction to it is also based around trying to send a message to the organization, right? Like we're disgusted with what you're doing as an organization, not necessarily the players, but like, you know, we want to be a, a franchise that we can root for that. We can be happy about that can win football games, obviously. The other thing here that I'll just tie into it is because it's along the same lines. I've also seen people were doing this Malik neighbors and Daniel Jones, right? OTAs they are kneeling down together. They're having conversations. They're walking off the field. They're doing their little looks like they're getting their handshakes together. Those are all things you expect to see between a quarterback and the number one wide receiver. But that couldn't go without it being that it's like, ah, New York giants made sure to get these photos out there. And you're like, made sure i mean these are going to be two of the primary guys you're going to see at otas you know it'd be like saying they put out the offensive line which we're going to talk about oh giants working the narratives around you know illuminor being a part of the rotation like all right or this is just there, there's only so many quarterbacks and wide receivers these guys are going to be having the conversations and again you're talking about your number one wide receiver and your number one quarterback in that vein before we get into offensive line and some other um, position battles I want to talk about. There was just a footnote here because you and I talked about this uh, last week, early last week, Malik Neighbors, maybe two weeks ago, setting the standard for what he should accomplish in his rookie campaign. Did have a nice article over on ESPN Plus coming from Mike Clay, who sat down and basically put out projections for rookies across the board here. Footnote, J, uh, J.J. McCarthy expected to be the second best projected with 3,500 yards, 19 touchdowns, and 14 starts for the Minnesota Vikings. We can get to the rest of that another day. But how about this, Andrew? If I told you that I had Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr., by the way, in the top three, only behind Marvin Harrison Jr. in terms of receiving yards and touchdowns, what do you think that Clay put out as the mark for Malik Neighbors in his rookie year? In terms of catches, yardage, or yardage, yardage or and touchdowns, yardage and touchdowns, baby. Uh, I'm going to say that he had him at 750 yards and five touchdowns. Well, I got to tell you, if you were looking for Brian Thomas Jr., you wouldn't be doing too bad with the Jacksonville Jaguars. 814 yards projected, five touchdowns. Five touchdowns, not bad. Also what they have Malik Neighbors at. Now, these are just projections here, but 1,033 yards. You know what that is? That's about within 50 yards of Adam Armbrecht's projection. Yeah, 1,100 yards, maybe five to seven touchdowns. I just, it's noteworthy that when you talk about it, because basically Clay makes the contention here, we could be talking about an all-time great wide receiving class, as we know it was coming into this draft. They have Keon Coleman, by the way, as the fourth highest with just over 800 yards, and then Roma Dunze coming in fifth there, 803 yards, six touchdowns. That's the most 
of the top five that you put into that category there. So he goes on to talk about Jamar Chase and Garrett Wilson, Amari Cooper, as we did, right? Some of the all-time great rookie receiving seasons. Really encouraging just to see the idea, at least on paper, that if people around the NFL are talking about 1,000-yard season for Malik Neighbors, everybody should start to get that buzz for themselves. And we've seen them catching some passes, right? Doing some things in OTAs as well. Coming back here in a second, let's touch in on the offensive line. Did some of those beautiful images from OTAs give Andy insight into what's ahead for the big blue line, plus position battles in the backfield and the secondary. We get into that all coming up next. And before we get into all that, Andy, we'll let you know this episode is brought to you by Pytential, P-I-E-T-E-N-T-I-A-L. That spells Pytential. It's an online assessment tool th free for individual users, and it's all about your well-being, setting a baseline, giving you tools to improve over time, and allowing you to check in with yourself to make sure that the goals mentally over the long haul of your life, over work issues, over career decisions, Keep it an even tempered, baby. Let's stay even keeled. Get over to Pytential.com today and check it out. P-I-E-T-E-N-T-I-A-L. Something that maybe some of these offensive linemen don't need to be overly concerned about, Andy. Because is, is it already set? Do, are the battles over? Have they been won as we didn't see what? The one combination I think we didn't see out there was Andrew Thomas when they wanted to show that, that nice unit. But we got four to five, and Evan Neal was included in that group. Yeah, it was interesting to see how everyone lined up originally of course the hysteria started the second that they released the first one as if like that is going to be the be all end all of this line That's but it. obviously they're testing some things out you mentioned joshua zudu played left tackle we expect it to be andrew thomas as long as do we think healthy. position battle yeah position battle on the left side with our, with our best offensive player That's probably right. not okay. uh i you know, obviously he was Bold at uh, license plate guys uh, char charity event um, on Saturday. He said he yeah. looked fine. He was playing in that. No issues. I think it was just kind of like a management rest day. Get other guys a little bit of reps uh, in there. But the rest of the offensive line was interesting and, and made a lot of people ask certain questions. And moving across that offensive line, um, you have uh, Illuminor at left guard. You have John Michael Schmitz at center. You have John Runyon Jr at right guard, and mm -hmm. you have Evan Neal, as you mentioned before, playing right tackle and getting those reps. Oh, there was a lot of people that had a very critical comment about that setup going across the offensive line for the Giants. Did you feel the same way as everyone else? Do you even know what everyone else was saying? No, what was the, yeah, what's the critical take before I, I'll, I'll give my impression of what they're doing, but yeah, what, what's everyone bothered by? Let me yeah, guess. Yeah, the, the number one thing that people are upset about, it's not Evan Neal playing right tackle because – have you, if you've heard Joe Shane and Brian Dable and everyone say, yeah. they said he is going to have every opportunity to be the right tackle. So I don't going know why you're shocked <laughs> by this, right? Like, yeah. okay, yes, he's out there. He's their first round draft pick. What everyone is very adamant about is that Illuminor needs to be at right guard and John Runyon Jr. needs to be at left guard so that if Evan Neal fails, all we're doing is kicking out Illuminor out to the right tackle position, filling yeah, the right guard, as opposed to. Uh, Illuminor moving from left guard to right tackle, mm -hmm. John Runyon Jr. moving from right guard. So they're already planning for the Evan Neal demise and saying our best situation is plan B. Plan B might be a better situation for us than our optimal situation, which yeah. I find hilarious already. But what, what are your thoughts about it? Well, okay, so if, if the Giants aren't going to set things up in a way to prepare for failure. Right now, whether or not we think that Evan Neal is not going to work out as the right tackle and he may not be long for this roster. OK, fine. But they're not going to set up the premise that let's assume that Evan Neal is going to fail. And therefore, we want Illuminor to be there so then he can kick out. Da, 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 da. They're trying. They're going to try to make their best offensive line. And by the way, this is a snippet out of OTAs. There's going to be a lot. You're going to see all these players move around and shift. But if you told me that the premise was we believe that Illuminor is the best left guard we have available on the roster that Runyon's the best right guard or and, and that Runyon's experience is better suited alongside of Evan Neal maybe in that role. And we like the idea of putting what we can create with Illuminor and Andrew Thomas on the left side of the line. We like that pairing, whatever the case may be. If they like that, they're going to go with the best version of their starting offensive line first. And I'll even go back to the top here. When you have Joshua, Joshua Zudu playing, getting left tackle reps because Andrew Thomas isn't out there. Let's remember about swing tackle opportunities, right? Who's going to be the backup? Is is there a possibility that Joshua Zudu can be a swing tackle? I, I don't know. There's going to be other bodies in camp here. But think about it in that version of it. If Evan Neal doesn't work out, who's the guy that might go into the right tackle role that is not a Luminor? 
because maybe they just want to keep these guys in set positions. I, I get the premise of it, of saying, are you going to trust the guy to go from left guard to right tackle? That's a big move. But if you already believe that Illuminor can play right tackle, you what's the risk here, right? What's the risk of saying, let's figure out what the best combination for our line is. And guess what? If the worst case scenario comes to fruition and Evan Neal doesn't work out, we're going to be shuffling a lot of things around because whether it's Illuminor from left guard or kicking him out to right out to right tackle, then Runyon has to move or not. Where are we filling in? You're going to need another guard at that point. You're going to have to figure out the shuffle in and around John Michael Schmitz. And by the way, second year center, maybe you want to go ahead and put two cemented players alongside of him on either shoulder and say, this is who you're going to be playing with. We don't have to worry about shifting and rotating players that we're not fully confident in. Uh, yeah, I, I'm fully in agreement with you, Adam. Thank Why you. would you put your suboptimal starting lineup out there thinking about when things go wrong? Like, to me, that makes no sense. You put your best foot forward. If it doesn't work, you pivot and figure it out from there. But you yeah. want to have options. That Last year, the challenge was that they didn't have options to go to when things went wrong. This right. year, it feels like they do have options and they can move people around. But, Adam, I don't know what people's expectations were. I mean, can we just level set here john runyon jr started at right guard 17 games last season yeah what do they think the giants were going to do were we going to move him switch it up out of position like that was that was what he was intended to be signed for the other piece of it is uh jermaine illuminor has started at right tackle has started at left tackle has started at left guard like he has started at all of these different positions yeah, yeah. he has clearly shown that he has the versatility to move across the line in a pinch. So the Giants are smart. They said, we saw what we liked from John Runyon Jr. at the right guard spot. He was durable. He was healthy. He played right guard. It was an area of need for us. Then they covered their bases and said, Illuminor can, can kind of be a swing tackle in a pinch, can play both guard positions. He allows us the ultimate flexibility, not knowing what we're getting from Marcus McCathan, not knowing what we're getting from Joshua Zudu yet. So for me, this makes no sense why people are all upset if you watch John Runyon Jr. and where he played last season. Of course, yeah. That means there's a reason why you brought them in. And how does it offer the most level of stability? If you're if you look at it from look at it from the Joe Shane New York Giants perspective, we have Andrew Thomas. He was here from the previous regime. We drafted Evan Neal. We understand it's a concern, but we still believe in him. We drafted John Michael Schmitz. That's three out of the five starting positions. Then we went and signed two veteran offensive linemen to help stabilize everything in between. That, that just seems to be the logic to me and the way that you want to approach. Now, obviously, they're only people aren't debating that. They're debating flipping them the other way around, so you have the kickability. So you'd still be plugging these two players in, just at different roles. I'm more intrigued to watch as we go through OTAs and into training camp, mention a guy like Azudu. Well, what's the intention here? What are the backup guards going to look like? Is Azudu, McCathan, how are they going to function? Do they have any opportunities to play on the outside? A lot of other bodies in there. We know Stinney was brought in as well. So is a part of this, too, something we'll watch for, is Stinney kind of in line to be the backup guard but behind a player like Luminor, behind a player like Runyon? And so if you're a Zudu, we got to try to find you a different role here, right? We know they drafted some young players in the middle rounds. Now it's about whether or not some of these veteran guys are going to push them for roster spots. So that'll be fun to watch for there as well. Next, though, my friends, let's talk about some of these position battles because we got Tyrone Tracy involved in the passing game, and it just got my wheels turning. This running back room is filled with not like totally young talent, but all guys kind of in that 23 to 25, 26 range. Who's going to shake out here? We're actually going to plant our flag in OTAs about how we think this running back room is going to shake out when we get into the regular season. We'll get into that in just one moment. All right. When we talk about the running back room, Devin Singletary, we had this conversation the other day. Andy gave some odds. Yes, Devin Singletary is available for Offensive Player of the Year if you want to go that route. Shocking to me. Because I don't, this doesn't seem like this offense is going to be built around the idea of, I don't know, run, run Devin Singletary into the ground. It just seems unlikely. But you also get inside of OTAs here, seeing Tyrone Tracy, he's getting used out there and some of the passing game looks pretty good in that facet of the offensive system in these limited sample sizes we're getting. And it made me think about one thing. Because when you go over and you take a look at the roster for the New York football giants, we understand that when you get into the running back room, they brought in Singletary. 
They also drafted in Tyrone Tracy. They also brought in Dante Miller. They also drafted last season Eric Gray. They also brought back, after losing him briefly, Jay Sean Corbin, who they liked coming out of Florida State. They still have Gary Brightwell in that room as well. It's very crowded. And I, st I, I started looking at it as, well, how do we shake out this roster in a way that, that makes it feel like these are the best versions of players going forward. Andy, I mean, we can do it one of two ways. I have an NFL prospect grade comp that I want to get to here. But go ahead, right, right now, just off the cuff, man. If I said, give me your three running backs that are going here, wh what do we have looking forward? Because I think we're going to do a much deeper dive on the skill sets of all of these players and how they complement one another. So maybe you can say that if you want. But are you... Is the running back room one of the more intriguing positions on this roster, even though we feel like, well, there's a reason why you brought in Devin Singletary here, obviously with the ties to the to the organization and to Brian Dable. Yeah, and, and we uh, have been getting feedback from some listeners about how we should probably do a breakdown of the running back room. I think there's yeah. probably a larger discussion to be had. But to, to your point on, on the running back room, I can't I can't shake what I've what I saw from Eric Gray out of position, out of sorts, just non-productive season last season. It didn't seem like he fit and gelled the way that I expected him to. And okay. so that is the reason why the Giants have brought in some extra insurance policies. We know Gary Brightwell is is on the roster, has special teams value, has only had limited um, action in the backfield. But bringing in Tyrone Tracy Jr. and bringing in Dante Miller, I mean – this also has the new kickoff rules uh, to keep in mind where special teams can put, play a huge factor. It's why Gary Brightwell has uh, special mm -hmm. teams value. It's why the Giants tried to get special teams value out of Eric Gray, and it, it was a colossal failure. I mean, if you were to ask Shame me right him, now what my, what my ideal, and I could only pick three, for you me, it, three. it honestly would be Devin Singletary, Tyrone Tracy, and Dante Miller. I think those three – are the ones that create explosiveness, fresh legs, special teams value, has all of those different uh, components involved. And I think each of them does something a little bit different. I think uh, Turbo Miller can can blaze it with the best of them. Sure. I think Devin Singletary is a guy who's shown to have a career over four yards to carry average. Like he can kind of weather the storm. And Tyrone Tracy, get him in the pass catch and get him out in space. To me, that is a pretty good compliment overall in terms of what you're looking for in a running back room. Yeah, so it's interesting, and I think you're right. I want to touch on the secondary here as well. There is a much deeper dive on these players. What I will say is, you know, Dante Miller obviously has this kind of buzz around him, right? What could have been if all the circumstances coming out of college were, were not <laughs> stacked against him? Where would he have gone potentially in the draft? Could he have been a part of the player pool? When we look at this, though, here's what I'll say. Devin Singletary, I mean, I was shocked to read that he is five foot seven. by the way. I mean, you would not think that to watch him play. He's 203 pounds coming in, whatever. But he's also a man of small stature. So the way that I looked at it was, you know, he's going to be your lead back, your veteran experienced player. 5'7", 203. You can look at a player like Dante Miller and say, like, maybe he's the, the guy in the wings, 5'9", 200 pounds. I might even think, though, that Miller, depending on what happens in camp, could be a practice squad type guy that bubbles up as the season rolls on potentially. I think Gary Brightwell's time may just be coming to a close. But here's something noteworthy that I would say, because I agree with you. It's not like Eric Gray blazed the trail here. Tyrone Tracy came into the NFL draft as a 6.18 prospect grade over on NFL.com. Good backup with some potential development to a starter. We like him. Complimentary. We'll see how he works. 5'11", 209 coming in. One thing I will say for you with a 4'4", Eric Gray is a 6'2". I feel like fans are forgetting this. A 6'2", 2 prospect grade coming out an eventual average starter, but he had production. He has athleticism. He has that total value score. I, I just find it interesting to your point, boy, talk about trying to put a a square peg into a round hole when it came to play some special teams. Why? Cause he never done it before. I, I, I think that we're maybe missing a little bit on him just in terms of his, where his value would lie. I find him intriguing to watch over camp to see if he carves out a roll, 5'10", 211 pounds. And my last note here is just that Jay Sean Corbin, did you know, and listen, he came and went, and he's maybe practice squad designated as well. You know that he came into the NFL at 202 pounds, and he now clocks in on the depth chart at 221? Like, I just find that really intriguing for a player that was said to be, hey, man, I can be a blazer if you get me out on the edge and let me go. I wonder if he's been working himself into a more complete back. It's a bigger conversation for another day. 
I tend to agree with you on, I mean, obviously on Tyrone Tracy, on Devin Singletary, I think that third spot is kind of up for grabs right now. And I just wonder if maybe Eric Gray still has that inside track to earn that role. Yeah, Eric Gray, as you mentioned, they tried square peg in a round hole. Didn't work special team-wise. But in, even in his limited running, Adam, he only had 17 carries, but he averaged 2.8 yards per carry. Yeah. So it's yeah. not like you're even seeing the vision. If he had no, no. 20 carries and was averaging five yards a carry, you could say, oh, this is interesting. Like, let's get more of it. Right now, there's a lot of question marks. Obviously, he was drafted for a reason by this same regime. So they are going to give him every opportunity to win that that second or third running back spot. And the weaknesses coming in for him, unable to drive through first level of contact, pursuit, able to rally and tackle him when the run spills out towards the edges. So these are some of those things, right? Something to watch for and obviously optimism that any of these guys, let's just see someone bubble up and really claim a third role here for Big Blue. Let's close out looking at the secondary here. We talk about OTAs, talk about Deontay Banks is out there breaking up passes. No questions about where he's going to be lining up. And then we look at a guy like Trey Hawkins, who is also breaking up some passes and there may be a part of you that says, why are we bothering having a discussion around Trey Hawkins, a late round pick that flashed early, fizzled, and then ultimately maybe is designated for the back end of this roster? Well, because what else are we looking at when it comes to the secondary right now? We know that in theory, Trey Hawkins can play on the outside. Question marks about Aaron Robinson's health. We understand that Drew Phillips is here now. It looks like Cordell Flott's going to have the chance to claim the outside corner spot. You can talk about Nick McLeod and these other players, but ultimately it's because this is still a very thin room. And maybe does this tie in for you, Andy, to the post June one designated cut dates for a lot of teams around the league when the market gets flooded with other names. And maybe we're only a week away from talking about, Oh, which one of these names is going to get brought in here? Cause as it stands right now, Trey Hawkins would still be one of my guys to be rooting for, to show something like he did early in the camp and season last year. Yeah, you feel like uh, Nick. Uh, you feel like Drew Phillips and Darnay Holmes are pretty much solidified at that nickel corner spot. Those two will work there almost exclusively uh, during camp. I'm sure they'll get a couple reps outside just in case of emergency. Um, and Holmes the big obviously mark is special is, teams it, value, which is great for yeah, him. That, yeah, that 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 too. the The other thing is, what what is Aaron Robinson in terms of this team? Like he's been injured injured for so mostly. Long, he's had so much promise coming in that yeah. you wonder like where he's at health wise. For me, OTAs in camp are fascinating around Aaron Robinson. Like, can he carve himself out a role here? You mentioned Nick McLeod and Cordell Flott. Dave all kind of Dave's came out and said Cordell Flott's going to get every opportunity to win that that role. I think they would want Cordell Flott to win it. But keep in mind, Nick McLeod is only 25, and the team has familiarity um, with him for, for quite a while now. So. I, I just think Nick McLeod is a guy that's going to get every opportunity. Obviously, was with the Buffalo Bills and came over to, to the Giants, so knows the Dayball and, and Shane relationship for a little bit longer. There's going to be a lot of battles in camp. I think, to your point, if a veteran gets cut, the Giants would think about bringing him in. But I don't know if he would immediately vault to the top. Does he yeah. replace a guy like David Long Jr.? Does he replace a guy like uh, you know Aaron Robinson who just can't come back from health injuries? I think that's yeah. what we're looking at. I w- if you're a Giants fan, at the end of the day, Adam, I would <sighs> not anticipate that any cornerback that the Giants pick up from here to the start of the season is going to command the starting outside role outside near Deontay Banks. I think that would be such a long shot. So get used to looking at people like Cordell Flott and Nick McLeod fighting for the first opportunity week one. Yeah. You mentioned about Aaron Robinson, man. Remember again, I, I like going back to these prospect grades. He was a six two eight coming out in the draft. Giants got him at the beginning of the third round. He was projected on NFL.com to be a second round draft grade. Now the injuries have derailed him a bit, but this is the hardest part about it because, okay, oh, it's just the injuries. If only he could have stayed healthy. I think a lot of times we do that with certain players because when you, when you don't see them play a lot, you can start to over elevate them. But remember, way too many busted coverages when he plays. Below average recognition of route combos has trouble over committing against release fakes. So there's things that you would have maybe seen him get more exposed on if we saw him more. Instead, we get this little flash. You go, wow, he looks pretty big. He's 6'1, 200 pounder, can move with guys. If only, if only. It, it, to me, it's almost like with Trey Hawkins. Oh my God, could this guy be? Well, then he was healthy and he stuck around. He went, hmm, maybe not. Right. So, It'll be interesting to see, and I think to your point, this still remains the position, whether it's going to be a veteran that gets cut or somewhere else, I I, I think we're going to get well into training camp and just be talking about, hey, Shane Bowen, how are you going to manufacture some success across from Deontay Banks? Because that was the case last year as well. Under Wink Martindale, it was still, 
well, it looks like Adore Jackson is starting to fall off here. Who's going to play on the outside? And how many times in games are we going to look and say, man, if only we had a caliber X player out there. But still a lot of time for moves to get made, obviously. This is OTAs, baby. We're not even into training camp. We'll have joint practices with other teams as well. That's always a good barometer here after we get away from, well, we're kicking our own butts. What do we look like against real competition? So we're going to talk about these, and Andy did a good job here, a little peek behind the curtain on the fly. We were going to talk more about the running back room, but there's more than just five, 10 minutes to discuss there. So we'll have that conversation as we work our way through training camp. We'll get into the wide receiver room, and I think we'll probably do like the all too early what should this roster look like coming out of training camps? We've got a lot of things planned for the offseason. You get over to YouTube at One Giant Podcast. You get over to X at AMAC214 at Adam Arbuck and at One Giant Podcast. Or maybe get your podcast needs fulfilled. Breaking it down all offseason long. Be sure to support us. Support the sponsors. Potential today. Personum other days. Really appreciate it. It means a lot for us as a show. And until next time. Until the best times. As Andrew Mackwitz would want, need, and nay. Demand the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue.